Great. So every year, Yoko is kind enough to lead us in a discussion of some of our favorite seeds from that <clears throat> season. And I have the great privilege of taking notes. I'm going to link my notes document in the chat if you want to follow along. And also, if you want to like get in there and correct my spelling of different varieties as we go, that would be very, very, very helpful. I'm like Googling things on the Johnny's website while we're talking to try to make sure that I'm capturing everything. So um, any way that you could help me out, that would be great. And I think other than that, I'm going to introduce our facilitator for today, Yoko, to um to get us going. All right, hi, can you hear me? So I'm seeing we're still doing the intros, right? Okay, so yeah, last year we started doing this. If we can just go around the room, um, if you can introduce yourself, um, say what farm you work for or have or um, work at and your best or worst performing variety or crop this season. So me and MC will go first, so you guys have a chance to think about it. <laughs> um, I'm gonna go with kale. Um, it did really well for me this year. And it's not that I changed up the variety, but I just wanted to mention what I used. So it was Black Magic for the Lacinato and Winter Boar for the Curly. Thanks, Yoko. Um, for me, I'm going to say that although it wasn't maybe our best, best crop, it was surprisingly good. We grew a um, purple Napa cabbage from Johnny's called Merlot. And generally, I think of purple cabbages as not so impressive and not always worth the time. But this one was really gorgeous, big heads, really full, dense, um, and really, really sweet and delicious. So I enjoyed growing that a lot. And I'll popcorn it to Susan. Okay, hi. Um, I'm Susan Mitchell. I own and operate Cloverleaf Farm in Columbia, mm -hmm. eastern part of the state. And um, I didn't have enough time to think. Um, I, I, for the first time, Hannah and I have talked about this, grew um, song, cauliflower, which is a sprouting cauliflower, although it didn't really sprout for me. It just produced heads and I grew it for a fall cauliflower, but it was still good. Um, I'll send it to Hannah. Hi, Hannah, provider farm in Salem. Um, I'm not sure that this necessarily was our best crop this year, but I was really pleased with our onions, especially because we pulled them out when they were like completely sopping wet in the middle of all that rain in July. And I thought that they were gonna just completely rot to mush in the curing process, but they did okay. <laughs> Nung in there and cured pretty well. Um, worst crop, um, I would say winter squash besides butternut was pretty disappointing for us this year. Just low yields, poor holding. I'll pop it to Dylan. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Yoko and MC, for hosting this event. Um, I'm starting a new farm in Newtown called June Gardens, and we just got started this fall. And, and so we don't have, we haven't gotten a full crop of anything yet. But uh, put down about half an acre of, of winter rye, very exciting. Um, but only about half of the field uh, seems to have germinated. So kind of sad. But what has germinated is it's nice to see some green among the brown. Um, and I'll pop it to Mia. Thanks. Um, my name is Mia Colasuano. I'm with Lathrop Farm in Lebanon, Connecticut. Um, I'd say my worst crop this season was my uh, summer squash. Easiest crop to grow and I could not get it. I just could not get the, the squash bugs and you know, cutting them out, the larvae, it just wasn't working. So I did not, I got like one summer squash. <laughs> <laughs> I will pass it to Kirsten. She's probably not here guys. Or She's here, but she might be back and forth. Uh, and then Holly. Hi, everyone. 
Holly Atkinson, Northwest Corner Farm, uh, co-owner with my husband, Stephen Plumley, who's also here. Our farm manager, Adam Buggy, couldn't make it tonight, but he sent a whole bunch of notes, so Yoko has them. Um, the big win for us, like, was a double win. This season was a Patterson white onion. And why, and they, first of all, they were amazing. They were like softballs and, hot, you know, they just cured beautifully and they were delicious and they were great. But the, the backstory was that our entire first seedings of onions failed. Um, we didn't have a heated greenhouse at the time. So we were scrambling kind of all over the, the, the town to find places to seed. So we just had no onions. And and um, Adam happened to have like a half a half a packet of Patterson's from last year from, you know, in his house. And so he seeded those and they just were like, woohoo. So that was, that was good. Um, I'll, I'll pop it to Steve just so in case he wants to add anything. Um, yeah, another one that did well were uh, baby butternut squash. Um, Which one? Variety. Baby nut, I think it was called. Um, I can look it up while we're while we're talking. Yeah. I'll look in the crop then. Yeah. And then our, like many others, our tomatoes didn't do very well, but particularly the brandy wines did very poorly. A lot of blossom and rot. And I'll send it uh, over to Aaron. Hi, um, I run a farm called Root Down Farm and I'm kind of an odd man out because I'm actually all the way over in Buffalo, New York, mm -hmm. but I saw your guys' Instagram um, and unfortunately we don't have a good um, connection amongst, amongst a lot of the small farms in our area because the area is so vast. Um, so I hope you guys don't mind if I pop in on this one. <laughs> Oh, um, here. Yeah, thank you. My husband and I met on a farm in Rhode Island. I used to farm in Western Massachusetts. He was on a dairy in Hudson Valley. So we've been all over the place, just not in Connecticut. <laughs> um, but we actually had a great spring here. So I would say our best crop was our spring broccoli, which we grew um, green magic and Monty. Oh, and I'm going to head it over to uh, Gavin. I don't think Gavin's been chosen yet. Hey, uh, my name is Gavin. My wife and I run Sweet Ring Farm in Newtown, Connecticut. Uh, probably our worst crop this year was also our squash. And then I think the best the best variety, best crop was our um, indigo cherry tomatoes. And I'll pass it over to Casey. You haven't gone yet? Um, I, I own Walden Farm in Moodis, Connecticut. Uh, our best crop was a hybrid cucumber. Um, and our worst crop was Easter egg, two radishes. They just didn't seem to want to do anything. Um, I'll pass it on to Kyle. Hi everyone, Kyle uh, from Mapleview Farm uh, and a one acre market garden in New York, uh, just about 15 minutes from Cup. And uh, yeah, I'm tagging in here as well. And uh, my best crop of the year, probably arugula. Uh, I had arugula every week of the year and counting. Um, and it was a good quality. Probably worst crop was fall, fall broccolis and several Nebraskas. Um, just kind of all got obliterated by the rain. Um, I'll pass it on to Mia. Mia's already gone. Let's uh, pass it to Sari. Hi, I'm Sari. I own your Huckleberry Farms. I just moved it from Ashford to Newtown. Um, my best crops were Japonica corn and shiso, but my worst was probably uh, the brandy wine tomatoes. And um, my kabocha didn't come out very well either because of the, the, the bugs. All right, I think it's uh one more time. Sorry. What's 
Sorry, can you say the name of the corn that you liked again? I didn't quite catch it. Japonica. It's a fee corn from Japan. Thank you. I think we just have Michael left. Michael, have you gone? He's on mute, maybe he's not around. Okay, well, let's get into it. Um, so I just wanna, oh, let me share my screen first. Oh, I'll share. <laughs> Slideshow, okay. So yeah, before I get started, I just wanted to go through a few notes that I've taken that I wanted to mention. Um, just if you're new, um, as men MC mentioned, she takes notes every year and it is meticulous. I mean, it's really good. So if you want access to previous year's notes, um, you should get them. I was just looking at last year's notes and it's, it's really good. And it's got, you know, information about, you know, disease resistance and pest management, um, of course, seed varieties. Um, so check it out. Um, I just wanted to make sure today that maybe we'll talk about slightly different topics that hasn't come up in the past. So um, we might not cover everything, but I definitely encourage you to look at her previous notes. Um, yeah, so this time around, a lot of the topics that I got were not necessarily seed variety topics, but kind of broader, kind of general seed related questions. So I have two slides at the end for those questions. Um, and I got less topics that were about seed varieties. So I decided to introduce what's called a lightning round and I'll name two crops. And if we can just go around the room, just because we don't have that many people. I think we can go around the room and, you know, if you can just say your best, you know, your, yeah, your best performing varieties of those crops. Um, and with the least amount of words, why? <laughs> so it goes um, pretty quickly. Uh, I also wanted to mention that this year was a really wet year. So I think people are interested in sort of you know, disease resistance and whatnot in the variety. So try to mention those as much as possible. And this year we made the seed variety discussion an hour and a half. Usually it's two hours, but we felt like it was like a little less daunting um, if it's an hour and a half, but I'm happy to stay on longer than that if people have more questions. Um, and yeah, because it's an hour and a half, um, let's make sure the lightning round isn't, you know, too dragged out. Um, all right, so these are today's topics. And yeah, remember there's a bunch of questions at the end that are, I think, very, you know, pertinent to all farmers and um, interesting questions. So I hope you stick around for those too. All right, we'll start with Solanaceae. Every topic I got were tomatoes. <laughs> um, all right, so starting with the top one, tomato seeds that can handle the types of uh, rainstorms we got this year. What performed well despite all the, the rain and the moisture? I didn't grow it, but I know that cherry bomb and esterina have really good split resistance for cherry tomatoes. Um, I know some people like grow both of those outside. People tend to stay away from any yellow that isn't sun sugar or sun gold, but esterina's got pretty good flavor. Um, and cherry bomb's a beast. Um, but I don't grow anything outside anymore. So it's, uh, I'm kind of at a uh, disadvantage, but I know uh, people have mentioned those two to me a bunch of times. We did Gold Spark this year for the first time and it was a freaking beast. Is that a grape or a cherry? It's a, wait, what did we talk about? Are we talking cherries? Sorry. It's oh, it a could be anything, anything that's like, you know. I agree with the same thing. Gold Spark is great. I agree with side. It's a beast and it, it like just, I didn't think it was going to do anything. And then it just kind of like blew everything else out of the water. Hmm. Anybody else's tomatoes did do well outside? I, uh, I use plastic mulch. Um, so I didn't really get affected by the rain, but with the weather that we had in the plastic mulch, the, um, 
100 cherry tomato was really prolific last year or this year for me. We always do Galahad um, red slicers outside, uh, especially later on in the season when the disease is more prolific. It's a really good sized tomato. Um, That's a good one. Yeah, did, did great this year. I planted a Japanese black tomato called Trefel or the Trefel family with my Shisu and it exploded around late July. Was somebody else trying to speak? We did um, Big Beef Plus and uh, came in and Ruby on and they did really well, both in tunnel and out in the field. Cayman did good outside. Yeah, the thing just doesn't die. <laughs> it does really, really well. And the flavors, we don't grow tomatoes that have no flavor. And it, you know, we only grow in determinants. So if you guys are determinant people, I don't have any help for that at all. Does anyone grow determinants inside here? I grew a BHN, but this year it was really bad for leaf mold. And so it hasn't been bad in previous years, but this year was like a wake up call. Like, okay, I can't do any non leaf mold. I think I've grown every leaf mold res resistant variety because we got this completely destroyed by it two years ago. So yeah, I remember that. Ian. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't get that until this year. That Like a whole yeah. house full of Charlotte Brown Christmas trees. <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, should we move on to indoor greenhouse tomato varieties, people's favorites? The only thing is no one ever mentioned any plum tomatoes, if anyone has any, I grew ones they like growing outside. Pomodoro sesquito, which is the weirdest name ever from Territorial, is one I grew inside, but I think it'd do well outside. It's an indeterminate. Really, it's a San Marzano type, really prolific, really good resistance to blossom and rot, um, which I usually have a problem with with those types. So oh, it's, uh, it's I've only seen it from territorial. So it's kind of, it's kind of a, you really don't want to order one thing from one company. I've never seen it anywhere else, but I'll type it out because it's got a weird name. Um, yeah, I just, oh, go ahead, Hannah. I was just going to say for a, it's a yellow saucer, but the sunshine sauce, sunrise, I think, sunrise sauce from Johnny's always kicks the red plums butts every year. If you want a yellow plum, it does really well. We did Pisano um, along with some of the heirlooms and we actually had a pretty decent plum year for outdoors, but Pisano just blew everything else out of the water. Mm -hmm. Plum, not a San Marzano? Well, let me just rephrase everything. We graft all of our tomatoes. So our production is a little bit better and the disease resistance obviously is a lot. Like even the ones outside, Kristen? I can't remember. Everything. Okay. <laughs> we have so much the craft. grafting machines there. <laughs> we, yeah, we just graft everything. It just makes sense to, we're doing like a handful. Why not just do it all? Right, right. Um, I'm sorry. I just realized, Ian, because you have the same name as your, you know, your your name on your oh, screen. Come on. I forgot that you, you didn't introduce yourself. So I know most people know you, but if you want to, you know, go ahead. Uh, I'm Ian from Wellstone Farm. <laughs> And I'm just going to copy Hannah because I had the same exact problems as she did. Terrible on the onions that actually turned out great somehow, magically. I had really bad um, onion maggot this year, which I've never had in the past. Uh, I planted them in late April, which everyone else does. And I apparently can't, I'm not allowed to do that on my farm. I have to plant them in mid-May, but they still did great. And all my non-butternut squash just collapsed. It was, a, it was a disaster. I think I had 200 feet and I could hold all the squash I caught, I uh, caught, I harvested in one arm, one arm load. It was terrible. Um, well, it's very comforting to hear about other people's winter squash experience. Was awful. Thank you guys for the that. The butternuts were okay. The butter, for some yeah. reason I grew uh, like winter sweet and winter blush and those guys and the cucumber beetles just evaporated them <laughs> like overnight. So I actually ripped them out of the ground in July. I said, I don't want to look at them anymore. Um, but I grew brutal brulee and autumn frost. If, if anyone hasn't grown autumn frost, I highly recommend that. It's ironclad and it keeps super well. Um, it's a little barrel shaped, guys. How's the, how's the yield on that one? I've heard that one 
market yes, customers. What's that? How's the yield on the autumn frost? I've had market customers um, say that that's the best squash they've ever had. Yeah, it's a, the seed cavity is a little on the big side, which I don't care for, but I think people are used to that because the acorns and whatnot, um, super good flavor. And it really does keep like a champ. Um, some people have a hard time because people don't always have the right temperature regime to hold winter squash. But um, I found that you can keep it in like low temperatures, like in the 40s, and it's okay. You can keep it in the 60s and it's okay. Um, whereas a lot of other ones get funky uh, if they're too cold or too warm. Okay, this is great, but we are on Solanaceae. <laughs> exactly, I was just going to say. <laughs> I Sorry. also just wanted to say that I think um, Athenia, you also came in after the introductions. If you want to just quickly say your name and your farm, and then we can maybe go back to the discussion. Sounds good. Yes, hi, my name is Athena. I'm from Knox in um, Hartford, Connecticut. And that's where I'm going. And I'm a second year farmer. All right. Okay, so where were we? We were talking about plum tomatoes. Um, one thing that I was wondering is, is there any leaf mold resistant plum variety? <laughs> Johnny's definitely doesn't have it, but. I've never got it in the one I grow, but I grow in a caterpillar and I grow in a in a uh, in a full tunnel, so mm -hmm. that might be the reason. Okay, so it probably doesn't exist. All right, can we move on to a favorite red cherry tomato? Cherry bomb. Same cherry bomb did really well. Just a beast. Sakura. Sakura. Sakura did terrible for us this year. So. It didn't do good for me either. So I'm, but it's only one year it didn't do good. So I'm, I'm willing to give it a second chance. It's been two or three years for us. We're like questioning if the genetics are getting depleted or something, or they're not keeping up with their huh. genetic line. I've grown Braveheart too, which, which is good. And that has leaf mold resistance as well. Um, I just had the seeds, so I grew super. Um, all right. Moving on to varieties of heirloom tomatoes that'll do well in a greenhouse. Or indoors. Grafted or ungrafted. Either. Or either. Kirsten, you want to take this one? <laughs> well, seeing as we grab everything, um, we have done ungrafted Cayman. Uh, we've done ungrafted Big Beef Plus, and a hand, a couple others, and they they still do really well. But they also have a pretty substantial disease resistance package, even without the extra from being grafted. I'll have to look. Let me let me do let me go into my homework really quick and I'll put some stuff in the chat box. And I've only got one, sorry. I've only got one year experience with Dark Star grafted in the greenhouse, but it seem to do reasonably well. I, I typically grow the high looms from Johnny's, Margold, Marnero. Um, Those are a little different because they're high looms. Yeah. And they have yeah. way better disease resistance. Like you do a bad leaf mold in your tunnels, a straight heirloom is going to really have a hard time, at least from my experience, because they just, they're really susceptible to those leaf diseases. Yeah. Have you grown, Kyle, the Mar Noir? The um, what? The, the mar the the first one that's written um at the last bullet point on the slide, the Marnar. Oh yeah, Marnar. Yeah, um, yeah, I did that one as well. I didn't do a great job of delineating where I planted, which ones of the um, dark purple one varieties. So I can't speak to it, but I feel like it did similar to the Dark Star and the Marnero. Hmm. Nothing stood out. None, none of them really stood out. Has anyone seen this is the disease question, but it's related to Mar Noir. Has anyone seen Stemphilium in their tunnels? I got it. I was one of the first people to get it a couple of years ago. Gray leaf mold. It's a southern disease that's starting to creep up here. Has anyone seen that? It went all over our tunnels this year. And Mar Noir is super uh, susceptible to that. It's leaf mold resistant, standard leaf mold, I think. 
but it's it was very susceptible to the gray leaf mold. Huh. That's really good to know. And it's good. I like Mardi It's got good flavor. I grow Cuba Libre, which is a a, a um, leaf mold resistant, like chocolate dark tomato, and I'm it. It's good for like the first half of the season, then it peters out, and the flavor goes right in the can late in the season. Hmm. Is there a purple one that's that kind of lasts the season? That... Mardi Noir, Before I got some filling, came close. Right. The problem is, and I don't know if anyone's seen this. The prices on these seeds have gone. Are absolutely ridiculous. Margold is eighty dollars for fifty seeds, mm. which is, is crazy. All right. Well, we need to move on from tomatoes, I think, but we'll do the lightning round. Um, so you can choose eggplants or peppers, or do both. Um, your favorite variety. Um, why don't we go with Ian because you probably have them off the top of your head, and I need to think about mine. Uh, I've. I planted way too many eggplant this year, so the one I like the most is Gaudi because it's spineless, and I get stuck incessantly with spines from eggplant under like assuming lowism under my nails. Um, Gaudi I liked; it was a standard uh, purple eggplant. Peppers I grow a little bit of everything the standards, but the one that stood out to me I don't know if I remember, did anyone grow Mojo, new one from Johnny's this year? It's a bacatum, so it's kind of real big and bushy and gangly, but it's. It's like a thicker uh, Jimmy Nardello, which is a little tiny bit of heat, and it's really robust, and it's a pretty good producer. I thought that was one. The restaurants loved it, absolutely loved it, and I'm sure at market sales, you could push it really easily. It's just got a little bit of heat, not too much, um, but I, it, it's, the problem is, is it's real gangly as a plant, so you got to keep that in mind when it's growing. It's called Mojo, M-J, M-J-O-J. Okay. Mo, so I, was uh, I don't know uh, what the uh, breeder had in mind when he named it or she named it. <clears throat> right. In less than uh, less than what Ian shorter shorter versions of Ian's answer. <laughs> uh, but let's go, Kirsten. Oh, you're unmuted, Kirsten. No, hold on. I had to find it. Um, what was the question? <laughs> I was in the middle of looking up the um, tomato varieties. What, what, uh, what eggplant or pepper, best variety for you? One or the other? Or both, but it can be one, yeah. Uh, what, what do we grow that's that pink one, Dancer? Or Anina? Anina's probably her best. Anina is the, it's basically Lissata de Gandia, but hybridized. It grows extremely well, Anina does. Dancer usually grows really well, but it didn't do, it did okay this year um but we grow those in a tunnel when we we didn't plant any eggplant outside this year um as far as peppers we just we got really bad disease this year so i can't even i don't even want to comment on that right. yeah okay i mean i was why i would walk through the field and have to toss like one out of every three harvested mm -hmm. uh mia um, I had a uh, ping tong eggplant this year. Um, it took forever to um, to germinate, but once we had it, it, it was really prolific and delicious, like the sweetest eggplant I've ever had. Nice. Uh, Kyle? Uh, I love the fairy tale eggplants, the mini ones, really good flavor, great market sales. Uh, Turkish Delight is also another eggplant I like. Uh, it's a Japanese variety or type. Um, Peppers go to is Carmen and Sprinter. Brocanto. All right. Uh, Athenia, did you have yeah, one? I, yeah, I did do a um, eggplant this year, but I took care of somebody else's and I'm not sure of the name, but it did not do well. I can tell you that. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't take, it grew very little. So right. I don't know if it was, it had something to do with the soil or whatever. I didn't, it wasn't about bugs or any, uh, anything attacking it. It just didn't do well. Okay. Uh, MC? Um, we did diamond eggplant and that was the only Italian variety that we grew. So honestly, I didn't have anything to compare it with, but I like the smaller size. I think we got a pretty good harvest off of them. We also did ping tong long. They didn't do great, but just not, it was our own fault not the fall of the seed. Um, for peppers, I also really like Carmen. 
Um, we did habanadas this year and they went off. Um, we had way more than we could sell at the end of the day, but for a time, at least the CSA members appreciated them. Susan? Um, I echo fairy tale. I also tried, um, Johnny's does, um, Hansel and Gretel, also miniature eggplants. I did the Hansel, which is a dark purple. That one did not taste good. I'm not going to bother with the white eggplant those. either because okay. white bruises too much. But um, yeah, definitely those Hansel, not doing it again. So learn lesson with that. Um, and then peppers, I just have moved exclusively just to... Um, Italian fryers. So I just do Escamillo and Carmen. That's it. No bells. I don't waste my time. And those two um, are just, you know, bomber. Have you tried Ornos? Um, I have not ever. Okay, it's a pretty good Italian fryer. Just a bit smaller. Uh, Hannah? Yeah, it is a bit smaller. Yeah. Um, no eggplant luck for a couple of years. So I won't comment on that. For peppers, Carmen's are always our best ones for bells. Uh, we've done Red Knight and Ninja for like a big blocky green to red bell. Then they are always pretty reliable for us. They're a little later than Ace, which is a smaller one. So we usually grow Ace as well for early peppers. And I also think Ace holds better later in the season. Mm. Great. Holly? Uh, for eggplant, we just grew one variety, Anina. It's our first season and it was great. Um, pretty uniform size, medium, sort of a light purple with pretty white streaks on it. So it sort of attractive and um, yeah, it was, it was great. And it was prolific, um, it was good. Um, very hard to store more than a few days. We, have, we had storage issues. So there was a lot of cold, whatever it's called. It just turns brown and it was, that was bad. So they didn't hold well, but that was our problem. Um, for peppers, we did a ton of shishitos and like too many. <laughs> Um, but they were good. And then we we grew Jimmy Nardellos, which were just so delicious. Oh my God, they were good. So we're going to do those again. And that has a Connecticut backstory, which I'm sure you all know. Um, all right. So, Thanks. Uh, Paul, good to see you. Are you there, Paul? <laughs> okay, we'll come back to him. Um, Aaron? Yeah, I'm kind of echoing a lot of the same things that people have been saying about peppers. If anyone wants to try one um, that has a, a very unique flavor, it's a sweet pepper. It's called Petite Marseille. I don't know if I'm saying that right. It is not Marseille because there's an extra set of, of uh, letters in there. Um, I get it through True Leaf Market. And then um, as far as Italian eggplants, uh, we had a lot of luck with Black Beauty. We had way too many eggplants also this year. Um, but they're more of like a bell-shaped eggplant um, that we liked. All right, sorry. Maybe she's not there. Sorry. Oh, okay. sorry. This button, the button wouldn't just unmute. Uh, I did well with the Tam jalapenos from Kitazawa Seeds. Um, I only grew a couple for myself but I sold out of the seedlings I grew this year because I guess there was an issue with other people getting the right jalapeno seeds. From what I understand, like, I can't even remember. I th it was like people were ordering jalapeno seeds and then it, they wouldn't come to be jalapenos. <laughs> They'd grow as other peppers. And then uh, habaneros did really well for me this year as well. Right, Gavin? Um, our jalapenos did really well. And also we grew, again, I can't remember the variety name, uh, but a mini bell pepper did really, really well. And they did really well market too. All right, I think I saw Paul. Paul, I think you're there now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, we can see you too. Oh, good, okay. Oh, I just wanted to, um, yeah, around us is I just eat those things like candy, so that's our favorite. And then, yeah, I would, I would second what um Susan said about bells. We kind of concentrate on on um uh Carmen's, and then there's a uh a giallo, 
it's these yellow. I, I think that's what it's called. It's, it's almost as good as Carmen, and it's got the pretty colors. You can have the colors without the problems of, that bells can cause. Yeah. Can you say that last variety name again, Paul? Uh, <clears throat> I think it's Mamma Mia Giallo. G-I-A-L-L-O. -L -L <laughs> Yeah. I don't know Johnny's is Cornito Giallo, right? Mm -hmm. the, the Cornito. Yeah, there's a, there's a few of them out there. We actually had a sport of Carmen one year that was yellow, but we lost the seed and then they came out with it a few years later. So I guess we, we missed our shot at fame. But yeah, there's a few of them out there. How does that compare to Escamillo? Kind of the same? Uh, I don't know if he's drawn that one. A smaller too, right? Escamillo is huge. The, the Mamma Mia Giallo is pretty big. Yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, I realized that I haven't said mine yet. And um, I have been looking for a good orange one just to round out the colors for the peppers. And um, I've tried Glow in the past. Uh, this year I tried Cornito or Encia and they were pretty productive. Um, I don't do direct comparisons of, you know, harvest weight. So I don't know exactly how it compares to Carmen's and Escamillo's, but they seemed really productive. Um, and for eggplant, I uh, my favorite variety, Toto. It's a, a variety that a Japanese farmer friend of ours introduced us to years ago. And now Baker Creek um, carries it, so we don't have to smuggle it into the country. <laughs> um, let's see. Who hasn't gone yet? Casey? Uh, we didn't grow, or, you know, we tried... We didn't grow very well uh, any eggplant or uh, peppers this year. Okay. And Michael? I don't know if you're still here. Yes, I haven't actually begun farming yet. I'm planning to next year. Um, okay. Right now, I'm just kind of in the planning phase at the moment. Okay, sounds good. And Stephen, you're with uh, Holly, right? That's right. That's right. We were uh, Anina's and, and Jimmy Nordello's. Okay. Yep. And then Nick, have you gone yet? All right. Let's move on to the next topic. So cucurbits. Um, there was actually no topics uh, for cucurbits, but this is this is my <laughs> my topic. Um, earliest and latest days to transplant cukes and unheated tunnels. Mid-May is when I usually put my first set in. Okay, and the last one? Uh, they don't do well, but early early August. I wish Digger was here because he grows them right into October, like really well, um, in an unheated tunnel. I don't know how. Oh, yeah? yeah. Oh, maybe I'll contact him. Okay. Is that similar to what everyone else does? Or maybe people don't do late. I pushed it to early May, um, I've, you know, yeah, I've got, I've got a climate battery tunnel um, and I do that in early April now. But then I've always tried to go a late one, um, I think late August, but it never pans out for me. Right, disease? Yeah, yeah, cucumber beetles just kind of, Okay. Right. All right. Well, let's go through the lightning round for cucumbers and zucchini. Um, I'll go with mine. So you guys have a chance to think about it. Um, I, I, we did Nokia's last year, uh, all outdoor plantings and they did amazingly. Um, but I think this year I might look at more disease resistance. Um, disease resistant varieties, but yeah, the Nokia did really well. Uh, and zucchini, I normally do two varieties, Noche and um, Dunja, but I think I'm just gonna just do the Dunja from now on. Uh, MC? For zucchini, we do Green Machine. That's really reliable and good. And I also, Shout out Zephyr, always does great for us. 
For cucumbers, it was not a great year overall. We tend to like the salt and pepper ones and find them to be pretty reliable, but with all the rain, they were kind of gross. Um, and then we tried the two like long Asian varieties from Johnny's. Um, neither of them did great for us, but I think that it wasn't necessarily a problem of the seeds. Was this indoor or outdoor? Let's see. We did the um, we did the salt and peppers outdoor. We did the uh long. It was like they had like sushi names. It was like yeah, unagi, so she, unagi and Itachi. Unagi and Itachi. Yeah, we did those in the tunnels. Oh, yeah. We did one yeah, round not, in not hot tunnels, one in the high tunnel. Neither of them did good at all. Okay, uh, Susan. Um, yeah, it's so interesting how things are like so variable across farms because like we grew Unagi as one of our um, tunnel varieties and they're amazing, like love them and they do so well. Um, part of why I feel like variety discussions are like helpful, yes, but also things are so like nuanced to like your specific spot growing. Um, we uh um I'm blanking on the other tunnel varieties that um we grew. <laughs> they all did well though. Um Corinto, yes, thank you, Ian. Um Corinto and Excelsior. Excelsior yep. is nice. Excelsior is great. Um out in the field, I like Sassy pickler from Fedco. We've done that for years and partial to that. It's kind of a bigger um, pickler. And yeah, zucchini, freaking hate summer squash. I mean, I, why does I even <laughs> grow it? I don't know. Just hate um, uh, We also do dunja as, as the green variety um, and um, mix it with zephyr, of course, which is like for late season, um, the one thing I'll, I, I'll say that I learned this year is that um, for like our, we do three plantings of um, summer squash outside and um, the last planting, I'm now only ever gonna do Zephyr because it's like the insects are insane by that point in time and Zephyr is very resistant, much more so than like any other, any zucchini, um, the cube, uh, beetle and squash. <laughs> Cool. Thanks. So Hannah, and if ev everyone can say if the cucumber variety is indoors or outdoor grown, that would be helpful. Um, we grow the same zucchinis that everyone else has already talked about. I will just shout out Golden Glory for a yellow zucchini from Johnny's, which is consistently awesome. Cons it doesn't get too big. It's straight and gorgeous. Good yields. Um, love it. Um, and then for cucumbers, our last succession, we grew Bristol for our slicer um, and Citadel, I think, for the uh, pickle. And I think I might try those all year because they just really did really well in the rain. They have good everything. downy resistance. They do, yeah. All right, Ian, you want to go? Um, well, same situation as Susan. I grow a Corinto inside, Corinto, Itachi, and Unagi. Itachi is a good yellow or white kind of it's not, it's a shy producer. I have terrible luck with inside cucumbers. And I also hate growing zucchini. Uh, we grow a cash machine early. We grow one early one, and then I stop growing it when everyone has zucchini. And then I grow again in the, in the fall, and we do cash machine. It's kind of a, just, I just throw a dart zucchini. It, I've never seen a huge difference in them. Um, I look for ones that are easy to hand harvest, because some aren't. Um, some need to be cut. You hand harvest the zucchinis? Mm -hmm. I twist. Huh. I don't know. But not all twist. A lot of them will just snap. And those obviously, like, I think no chair dungeon, one of those doesn't need you need to hand up. But cash machine twists really easy. I'm just lazy. Interesting. Okay. Uh, Kyle? Uh, I grow cucumbers inside um, Corinto and Excelsior, uh, pretty much exclusively there. And zucchini, I've grown green machine, dunja. I'm not really pleased with them. I just think the flavor is terrible. Um, but I would shout out to yellowfin. That is an excellent yielder, excellent flavor. Summer squash. All right. Uh, Athenia? 
Yeah, I did not do any cucumber or zucchini this year at all. I did cucumber. Good for you. Um, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I did cucumber, and I forgot what the name was. Yellow something. They were huge. They were so pretty. And uh, this was a year and a half ago, and a year, two years ago now. But um, I didn't get to taste them, although they looked delicious because the animals got them the day before I was going to harvest them. So I was not happy about that. <laughs> but I can't. I'm sorry for the dog box. I haven't. I have five. Oh, I can't hear them. All right, Kristen. Um, we grow mostly indoors with our cucumbers, uh, Lagos, Corinto, generally in Bristol. Usually do really well. This year, Corinto just did better than the rest of them. Um, Excelsior did okay. We just have some, we just have disease issues where we were. Um, we did some outdoors, but I don't remember what we planted and they did okay, but I just don't like doing cucumbers outdoors. Um, for squash, you, are you just sticking to zucchini or are you talking about yellow squash also? Oh, uh, yellow squash is fine too. Um, so yeah, Zephyr's hands down just the beast. Uh, we do Delta and Grand Prize for yellows and they actually did really well this year considering the amount of rain we had um, and disease that came through. But Dunja, Green Machine and Cash Machine, we've done. We usually do that every year and we kind of just mix and match we do some loonies varieties also like alexandria and magda and they do okay cool all right steven and holly cucumbers were market more in the greenhouse that's all we did um and they were pretty good um right we yeah they were enough and then uh for zucchini um, we had picked out a coco zell that either couldn't get the seeds or something. So we switched to something called costata, which is just means striped in Italian. And it was great, firm, great flavor, not as boring as regular zucchini. Um, and next year, we're going to grow Zephyr for sure. I've heard like three or four people mention it. All right, Mia. Sorry, I stepped away. I don't know if you tried me earlier. Um, I did um, Corinto and Market More, and they do really, really well. Um, I'm actually looking for a suggestion on a seedless, uh, like a European style or Japanese style. I don't know if anybody uses, um, if anybody has a recommendation for an organic seed. Well, some people mentioned Unagi. That would be one of them. Um, oh, what's it called? Unagi, U-N-A-G-I. I grow gotcha. in Thank you. KYA. Yeah. Um, Paul? Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, cool. Um, I think people mostly talked about the ones that we grow a lot of, um, Corinto in the greenhouse and Bristol in the field. Uh, I think Bristol got replaced. That was, I, uh, saw that in Johnny's. There was some new variety. So, uh, hmm. I don't know what the deal is on that. Um, I would just, uh, I, it's not going to cure all your problems, but I know we're just supposed to talk about varieties, but I put in the, the t uh, chat there, um, if you haven't messed around with um, calcium silicates, that's something to try. Um, cucurbits are, are uh, like there's really good documented evidence about their need for silica. So, um, and it's uh, almost as powerful as synthetic fungicides if you're low in silica. Uh, with powdery mildew, at least, which is the, one of the main problems you get in the late summer and fall. So uh, maybe something to try. It's uh, will last the night. You can get it at Fedco or Seven Springs. Uh, just something to think about. No, oh, thanks for that. No, we usually have uh, discussions around, yeah, disease and pest management, too. So anything that's relevant is appreciated. Sure. All right. So Dylan? Um, moving on to Aaron. Um, we live in a bit of a downy middle mildew vortex in Western New York. So all of our cucumbers are all grown outside because if we grew them inside, they get the disease before they ever start producing. So <laughs> we stick to, uh, it's called uh, DMR 401, which is a, the best downy mildew resistance. We've done it against Bristol. Obviously Johnny's discontinued Bristol and is going with another downy mildew resistant variety. 
Um, but if you don't have those problems in your area, then I'm jealous of you. So we can't even grow things like lemon cucumbers because they just get destroyed by the disease. Um, as far as uh, zucchinis, we love Green Machine and I can also back up everybody that said that about Zephyr and we struggle with yellow squashes. So thank you for mentioning those two varieties um, earlier. I think it was Mia maybe mentioned them, thanks. All right, sorry. Uh, for zucchini, I was gifted gray zucchini seeds, but I couldn't tell you the exact name of them. They did pretty well. Um, for cucumbers, I grew, uh, Japanese progress. Um, it's a, a disease and mildew resistant hybrid and, uh, they exploded in my garden um, I couldn't pick them fast enough by, I want to say June. If I didn't pick them that day, they'd grow the size of my arm. All right. Uh, Gavin? Uh, we just grew a, uh, a variety from giants called lemon cucumber and they did fantastic, um, harvested buckets load uh i think it's literally called lemon cucumber and it's um shaped kind of like a baseball or softball um yellow to white coloration and pretty sweet so it's like a nice slicing variety and it produced really well and again it did really well market and then i think we also did a green machine which uh, our zucchini or squash really got hit hard with the beetles this year mm. casey uh, uh zucchini black beauty and cucumber, we just did a, a hybrid cucumber, um, but we, I couldn't keep up with either of them for picking when they came into harvest. Awesome. All right, let's move on. Um, I might, because it's 5.55, I might, after the lettuce lightning round, um, skip the the next few just to make sure we get to the end. Um, but yeah, lettuce, there's a lot of notes in previous, um, um, you know, MC's notes from previous years. So definitely check those out. Um, but yeah, this year I only got two submissions for lettuce and it was, yeah, similar. So heat tolerant. You're, Usually you're, what we, what's that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, the very first time we did this seed variety discussion, we had a Johnny's rep and, it was amazing, but she, one thing I remember her saying is that a cold tolerant um, head, uh, let, lettuce is also going to be likely to be uh, heat tolerant. So they're kind of um, go hand in hand. So um, yeah, muir is a great all season variety for sure. And then when growing fusion, I tried that this year. Yeah. our heat tolerant stuff is uh, adriana and Zalbadora, but we also just to side note if people are using um shade cloth on their head lettuce we do we use shade cloth on all our summer head lettuce so it doesn't get bitter i don't know if that's a thing people are aware of yeah can you spell that Zalbadora? yeah i'll put it in the chat it starts with an x so it's odd That's a mini, right? Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a mini romaine. And the Adriana is a, a, a bib. I was just going to ask for a recommendation on a romaine. I tried two different varieties and they didn't do great. So you said the Zalbadora. Any, any others? Fusion is a romaine uh, Batavian or summer crisp cross. It's not a pure romaine, but it's more upright. Um, for some I grew it, it's pretty lettuce, it's almost like an open fountain, open type head of romaine, similar flavor. Fusion, you said? Yeah, the Chinese carries it. I, use I really like Oh, go ahead, Kyle. Uh, I was gonna say, I really like Monte Carlo for romaine. It's a That's sort good. of mini, mini romaine. I, I grow that year round. It's a good performer for me, heat and cold. All right, Mia, I do, um, Blue Rock for a full size 
remain and they do really, really well. I experimented planting through the summer this year, just a small patch for um, the height of the season and they still performed pretty well. Another good one for heat resistance I found is Bauer. It did pretty well. It's not listed for heat resistance, but it did okay. It's an oak leaf. Uh, if you don't want to pay the money for, oh, it's a really expensive one. The one cut, I forget the name. I'm spacing oh, out here. Um, it's really good. Bauer, B A U E R. Right, because this topic, what this person was asking for, uh, specifically a red leaf. Um, I say this every year, but new red fire is what I grow all season long, and it does well through the heat. And I do switch it out in the fall because it doesn't do too well when it gets really, really cold. But yeah, during the summer, really good one. And does that one have a very loose kind of structure? Does it tend to like fall apart when it's handled? Um, I mean, it it can, it can stretch out if you don't harvest it in a timely manner. How big do you pick it? They get pretty big. Okay. Yeah, they're really big. I was just going to add, uh, Yoko, you mentioned um, the Johnny's rep talking about uh, varieties that are typically cold or heat tolerant will also be cold tolerant. The Red uh -huh. Cross, uh, Red Butterhead did really well both in the spring and the fall. Red Cross. Nice. Does anyone have any other recommendations on red, uh, red leaf lettuce? I I've done well with Cherokee. Uh, it's sort of like a romaine type, it grows more upright. Um, I think also Skyphos and Adriana both do really well. They're like a butter or bib type. They just tend to they look really beautiful in the field. They don't present well uh, by the time they get to market, um, but they're pretty. I've grown rook's side. Um, it's kind of kind of a red oak leaf. It's okay. It can be a little fragile. Yeah, I'll rook's chime. Side. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna chime in. Um, Alkindus has always been a favorite. Red um, with green tinged sort of bib. Less so now. It didn't do it as great this year as it has in years past. Um, but it's a beautiful lettuce. Um, I also like trialed mini romaines this year from Johnny's um, Green and Dragoon, just to like see what a mini was like. So that maybe it would, you know, deal with kind of heat because it was just going to be smaller. And eh, I mean, like, I don't know. It's it's small. It's for me and for what I want. I don't think it really fits the bill, but. Um, they are, they're kind of cute, but they're small. They are. I've grown them both. They're, they can be finicky, too. All right. Should we do a quick lightning round on the favorite heads and favorite mix varieties? Um, Ian, do you have any? Uh, Mirror, Fusion, and I like Newham as a little gem. Uh, I don't do mix. Um, but Mirror, we grow Mirror and... Uh, and Newham a ton. Newham's a real nice, dense little gem, disease resistant. Uh, MC? Uh, I think probably New Red Fire is, is the best we've got going. And then we do the spicy mix from Johnny's. Um, okay. and, that's not, and that's nice, but not lettuce, actually. <laughs> Oh, and when I wrote mix, um, uh, I I grow out like individual heads and cut them as mix, yeah. so it doesn't have to be a mix, you know, variety. It can be one variety. Uh, Susan, um, we switched up a green, a, like a long season green this year, and did Bergams Bergams Green from Johnny's. It's organic, and it was pretty awesome. So I liked it. Cool, Hannah. Um, I don't know if we have any heads that like really stand out for us. I put in the chat cherry. We grow long season for red, which is pretty good. Um, we do green. I do a lot of green forest for romaine. 
Um, and then as a mix, we do, we mix the Salon Nova Premiere and Foundation. It's expensive. I haven't looked to see how much it is going to be this year, but it's reliable for us. Um, Kyle? Um, so for heads, um, you're, so what I try to do, I guess, is use the same variety year round. So I grow year round and that just reduces the complexity to have to switch varieties from hot to cold. So Muir, uh, Cherokee, and a little bit of magenta. Um, I also like to do Adriana and Skyphos if I want to do more of like butter, more delicate heads. Um, and then I also do mini heads. I sell them as call them like little gems. They do really well. They have a better, um, I guess, profit per 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 bed foot. Um, so Sego Lane, uh, Rosane, um, Monte Carlo, the mini romaine. And I've also been experimenting with winter density as a heat and cold tolerant one that's done really well for me this year. Newham uh, does okay, just doesn't work well in the cold uh, or the hot. It's kind of in the, in the short seasons mix. I just use um, Johnny's, mostly John Nova mix, and um, I'll do baby leaf lettuce with um, greenhouse, five star greenhouse mix. Cool. Um, I'll interject and in um tell you guys mine heads i would say my favorite is skyphos um it it's just hands down the the most popular um it's usually really reliable throughout the season and for mix um yeah i'll give a shout out to seagull lane too again um i think i mentioned this last year too but it's like you know so i cut the uh i spaced the mix um lettuce varieties closer together and i cut them and put them into a mix and seagull lane is just it's it's very reliable and it's also really heavy so when i harvest them it like makes up you know the it goes really far because it's so heavy and our bags are weighed out our lettuce mix is weighed out okay so let's see athenia yeah i did do lettuce i did it i don't know the name of it spot is spotted leaf lettuce and it, it was very good it did really well and I did um, the uh, purple leaf lettuce or reddish leaf lettuce. And I did, but I don't remember the names of these things. I just, I have them written down, but I, I don't well, off the top of my head. I don't yeah, remember. Yeah, no things. worries. Yeah. Okay. Um, but they yeah. did well. Cool. Mia, go ahead. Um, I had Muir, Elkindus, Milagro, and New Red Fire that did really well. Cool. Paul? Oh, you're muted still. You're still muted, Paul. Maybe he can't come on. Okay, Kristen. Um, sorry, I was dealing with the credit card company. My card got stolen, so... Um, what am I doing? Oh. <laughs> uh, favorite heads, uh, lettuce head and lettuce mix variety. Uh, magenta was really good this year. Um, yeah. we kind of had a weird, our, pl our, our plannings were just off. The timing was just off. So things just didn't grow at some times a year. Um, so yeah, magenta was really good. Mirror is always nice for the summer. Yeah. Um, we did seagull lane this year and that was super fun actually to grow. Right. It's pretty. Yeah, I just it was so compact and really pretty. Um, Ruzai hands down is just there always. What is it? Oh, the Rooksai. R O U X A I. Yeah. All right, Aaron. Um. Yeah, I'll kind of throw a monkey wrench in this and just talk about our winter heads. Heads. Um, we grow Hungarian winter pink, which is like a pink bib, um, that we harvest all the way through the end of January. Um, and then this year we're trying red tinged winter. Um, see how that one goes. It's like a red loose leaf. As far as mix goes, we don't grow any mix, but we do like the Salanovas, the incised and the sweet crisps for um, the winter time. Great. Holly and Stephen. Yep. We grew a ton of Salanova, both in the greenhouse and the field. And 
we tried uh, Green Towers Romaine, which bolted in like a nanosecond. The minute it was <laughs> like, terrible. Um, ovation lettuce mix. Um, Adam's notes performed well under shade cloth with adequate irrigation. Um, but after three cuttings, it got kind of tough. And then we do butter heads, which were good, but just a, a few. And then as a joke, we sort of, we planted some iceberg seed <laughs> that Adam had and people loved it, but it was iceberg lettuce. <laughs> so, but it was fun. Okay. Paul, I, I think you're, you're back maybe. Maybe I, I, I'm not a zoom guy and doing it on a phone is tripping me out. Okay. Right. Um, Becca does the lettuce. Um, but, and I'm just trying to, I know she spent a lot of time, uh, messing around with Salanova varieties and I'm looking at them here. I don't know if you want me to go down them, but some of them don't taste that great. So we trialed a lot of those, uh, I don't know when they came out, whatever, seven, eight years ago. And, um, uh, yeah, it's, I'd second, you know, green forest Cherokee love lock is a good one in the summer. Um, Adriana, um, Rui, yeah, you guys hit them up. Um. Yeah, Skypost is, is popular too. Yep, that's all I got. Cool. Uh, Aaron, oh no, you, you already went. Um, Dylan. Hey, yeah, um, I only have garlic, tulips, and cover crops in the ground right now, so didn't get anything from this year. All right. Uh, uh, but, uh, okay, cool. Gavin. Uh, our deer tone did really well. It's like a green, I guess it's sort of like a butterhead. Um, Nevada is a Tropicana variety, did really well. I think I mentioned Red Cross did well in the fall and spring. Um, and then our remain actually did really well uh, also, both the uh, red and green mix. And then we actually, we, we seeded uh, just Johnny's, I, I literally was just called a, um, a mixed lettuce and they produced fantastic. Well, Casey? Salvania um, red bativa and uh, for head and then mix. It's not really a mix, but Paris Island. Hmm. All right. Um, sorry, Nick, were you? Maybe I didn't call on you last week. Or was it? I can't remember. Are you the one who's just getting started? Okay. All right. Let's move on. Uh, Brassica. So we had a question about red cabbage for fresh market and storage. I don't grow red cabbage anymore, so. Neither do I. Who has a good variety? I said at the top, but the Merlot was really nice for us for a Napa. Right. We liked Calibos. It's a cone shape. That's red, sorry. <laughs> okay, cool. Anyone else grow red cabbage? Uh, let's see. We did Tinti, I think, was a red. I, don't know if, I can't remember if that's pointy or not. And Cairo. A lot of a lot of the cabbage problems with reds are you, you need to look for ones that are black rot resistant. That's true. Um, and then and have a lot of boron. That seems to that seems to be two really important things for growing cabbage, and it doesn't really matter what variety you put in it. Yeah. Um, I'm missing those two things. Yeah. Do you apply boron um every year, Paul? We do. We do um a pre-treatment on all our fields, and then for really boron hungry crops like brassicas, beets, celery, celeriac, um, we do at least one foliar spray and it's got to go in really early like if you're if you're looking at your crop going gee i wonder if it needs boron it's way too late I, from what i've read it needs to happen like at like the six leaf stage um before that you know between a couple true leaves and like six right okay when you spray it on what do you, like how do you do you mix it with anything else or just the just the boron um that's a good question. Uh, let's see. So for the um, uh, field sprays, we normally, I, about four or five years ago, I started uh, getting soluble humate and humates and fulvic acids and, you know, just kind of mixing in the boron and then um, 
adding the humates for um, foliar sprays. I'm not sure whether that stuff helps or hurts. Uh, it's really difficult to keep in soil. So um, right. mixing it with the humates gives it something big to hang on to for the, the pre-spray. Yeah. Paul, do you just use solubor for that? Or do you buy this? Yeah, yeah. Solubor is is fine. Um, you can also, I've tried for years to find a blender who would blend it into fertilizers and then you could just sort of apply it as you go, but um, that doesn't work. So we just put it in a boom sprayer and, and run yeah. over our entire farm in the spring with, with solubor. It. Yeah. yeah. It really, it, 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 it it's sort of a game changer with brassicas, yeah. Huh. That, that, I that was so well. brassicas. Oh, sorry. And the, the, the other thing that's uh, weird with brassicas is, is, is honestly, I mean, I've been around plants a long time. I, I somewhere along the line, I missed that molybdenum is essential as an essential micronutrient. Mm -hmm. And um, if you have no molybdenum, they can't uh, uh, process nitrogen effectively. Um, so. That's another one, and bor and um, brassicas can are big. They can have trouble with that too. But I, the boron is usually the culprit. Black rot resistance is hard to find, um, but if you there's uh, I, think, I know Cornell has a couple of lists where they'll list black rot resistant varieties, and um, honestly, we just don't grow it if it doesn't say black rot resistance. The other thing you can do is heat uh, uh, treat your seed. So all our brassicas are are heat treated. Um, and we stop growing. One thing I, I love them too. Those uh, what are those uh, rutabagas? Gill feathers. I love gill feathers, but every year the black rot would start there, and uh, so we stopped growing those. That helped a lot. Oh. Um, but you, you can um, you can move that stuff around. Really, it's a bacterial disease. You can move that around, and um, just by walking through your crops and and red cabbage is a real, really sensitive. I grew uh, Botrans. Uh, green cabbage, which had really good black rot resistance, is listed for it. It it's, okay. sits real high on, uh, on the plant. It's pretty good. So, Paul, that's just for red cabbage that you go for the black rot resistance or all cabbage? All cabbage, yeah. It, okay. It's one of those things where you're like, black rot? Well, how come you have black rot? And then you get it and you're like, oh, wow, okay. And it, it can be, it can be um, seed borne. Um, so that's that's the problem. All, and all you have to do is have either one ineffective heat treatment or one seed lot that came through with uh, black, the, the black rot spores. And um, it's it's really destructive, very destructive disease. All right. Uh, favorite French breakfast radish varieties? People grow them? I got rid of D'Avignon and when that happened, I stopped growing them. Yeah, I haven't found one that's as good as D'Avignon, I feel like. Trisha's okay. What is it? Patricia, it's been on the West Coast for a while. I think Johnny's just picked it up. Huh. I've been using uh, uh, Nelson, and I think Johnny's has one just called French Breakfast. Um, they do okay, but I'm looking to try. I think there's one from High Mowing I want to try hmm. this year. Yeah, Devon used to be so good. I feel like it used to be so productive and so many out of so you know, good. Planting and now it's like every variety mm. I try, it's just something wrong with it, you know. Um, I would love to do this lightning round because I don't think we've ever really talked about turnips and radishes in the past, these discussions, but I do want to get to the, the end. So I'm gonna skip that. Um so yeah, APACA. I personally had a lot of well, my carrots usually get alternaria, but it's once they've, you know, sized up. So it's not that much of an issue, but this year with the rain, it was, since we're a small farm, it just kind of catches like wildfire. So it was pretty bad. So I was wondering if people had good alternary resistant varieties. Bo uh, Bolero. Other than Bolero. <laughs> Has anyone grown the sugar snacks? Is that good? It's big. It's, I mean, you can get really long. So okay, there's some harvesting issues with it. it. Snaps a bunch, but it's very, it's, it's pretty. And it cleans pretty easily, as I remember. I gave it up because it was yeah. just too big. It doesn't store well. If you consume it right away, 
great, but don't keep it in your cooler for too long because it doesn't hold on to its sweetness for very long. Fresh oh. market, very nice tasting. Interesting. Any other carrot favorites? Napoli, great early. Yeah, I grow that one year round. Yeah, it doesn't have great disease resistance, but I can't, I mean, I can horse through it. Depends how bad you're, I have wicked bad fall disease pressure on my carrots, so I just do Bolero. Yeah, I think in the fall, I'm just gonna do Bolero. Does anybody have yep. any favorite like fall seeded carrots that they then harvest in the early, early spring in their tunnel? Does anyone do that? I do that with no. Napoli. Yeah, you can do that with Napoli. Mocum. We we love Mocum for just about everything except the alternary season. Yeah. Yoko, what's this um Japanese carrot that I, I think I saw on, on one of your, your social yeah. media? Vegetable. That's the prettiest vegetable I think I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> who's talking? I, I can't even see who's like talking right now. It's it's Paul. I can't. Oh. I don't know how to. Hold on. I don't like. I have to. It's weird. I have to go to two different places to unmute myself, and I'm about yeah, ready. To yeah. Yeah. No, it's funny. It's um, um. It's on territorial called Samurai Red, and I just recently went to that um the website, and there was two reviews, and it's absolutely terrible. <laughs> but it's, <laughs> it's. I don't think these people know how to grow it. Um. But basically, you you can only grow it in the fall. Um, and expect to have, you know, a good amount of bolt. And that, that's just, you can't avoid it. Um, it is, oh. um, yeah, it bolts. Mm. You just can't avoid it. Um, mm. So we charge a little bit more for those and they're, they can get really, really long. So it's not as easy as orange carrots to harvest. Um, we usually with orange carrots, just pull it out of the ground and it's, it comes out really easily. But with the red carrots, we got a fork. So it's like definitely a little bit more, more work. And then because it's an heirloom, the, the sizes are all over the place. So then we have to spend time, um, you know, putting it into three different sizes just because it's just so variable in size. So those are the things that come with the sort of heirloom qualities of it, so. Has, has anybody found a, col a, a, a colored carrot that tastes other than orange that tastes good? There, I mean, I, I want to stop growing them because it looks beautiful. You sell this bunch, and I'm like, God, I, I don't want to see these people's faces when they bite into this after a mocha because it's, yeah, no, I see people shaking their heads. Nobody's got an answer. Well, these red carrots <sighs> are really good. They are. They taste good. All right, I'm, I'm definitely trying them. I'm definitely trying them. That's going down. Okay. Yeah. And it's true. It's, it's such a beautiful vegetable. All right. I, let's yeah, I do like oh. the flavor. I'm sorry. I, I was just gonna say, I do like the flavor of white satin, but maybe that's not a common consensus. That's a white, it's very productive and you can grow it throughout the season. Um, also it was sometimes more productive than our yellow or sorry, orange uh, carrots. Any more comments on carrots in general? Okay, um, alliums and cunipods. So someone wanted to know shallot varieties, good ones. Kirsten turned us on to creme brulee and that was really nice. Really, really nice. I always grow, um, oh my God, I just, just forgot. Matador, that's the one. I've been growing that for the last few years and they're really productive. They they do really well. We also grow conserver, which can get really big, and it's good for. I sell it fresh. I don't cure them. I sell a bunch of fresh, and restaurants love that because they're really big. Um, the big ones are tough to cure, though. Huh. We really like creme brulee. They don't tend to form doubles. <clears throat> we also tried Innovator this year, and that did okay. We had a really big issue with purple blotch that kind of started with one of the shallot varieties. And I don't remember which one it was. And then from there, it just like spreads it to everything. And we had it all year on every, any alien crop that we tried to grow, but also it was like super wet and um, nothing we put on it slowed it down really. So I don't know. I wish I knew which shallot variety that it started at, um, but it was, 
we only grew three, so it was either creme brulee, innovator, or um. <laughs> Did you start no. from seed? Yeah. Start from seed? Did, does it come with seed? I don't know much about purple, purple blotch. I don't think does. I don't think so. I think it. I don't think so. Um, but it started when it started to get really, really wet, and I think it was July, end of June. I don't remember, but it just went every alien we had except for i think that some of the chives <laughs> got it you have to catch it like right when it shows and i i didn't know what i was actually looking at because we've never had it before so i just thought it was something that it would grow through unfortunately it didn't and then it just went everywhere hmm. okay uh since we are yeah it's uh much time left let's move on to spinach for the field spring and fall and also while we're on the topic of spinach leaf miter resistant spinach i don't think there is any yeah i grow space year round well i'm not so much in the midsummer little summer i've tried but failed um but that one does well for me and also not quite on the list, but Red Long of Florence is a purple long onion that market customers just love and it looks beautiful. And it's great. I'm glad they changed to the Florence from Tropea because those Tropeas were, were like round for a couple of years. Yeah, they're a really good seller. Um, did somebody, so any of you have issues with your fall spinach? Ours was transplanted um, during that heat wave in the first week of September, and something happened to all of them, <laughs> and it like all mostly died. So it was bizarre, um, but mostly I'm I'm pretty sure it's to do with the heat. We grew Colibri, Space, and Corvair, and all three had the exact same, um, you know, effect from it. What were the what what it looked like, uh, um, Yoko? Like how what was the um, symptoms? Oh, what were the symptoms? What were the symptoms, Alex, of the spinach? I don't even remember. They just like shriveled up and died. Did they yellow and they out and then shriveled up and die? Shriveled up and died. Like, honestly, like that was transplanted, but there would be nothing. Did you have, did you have grubs? Wait, at, at, what, at what stage of growth? Were, were they like seedlings or, or just like full, full grown plants? Or? Well, this is right after we transplanted it. They just went downhill and completely like 90% of them just like disappeared. And the same thing happened to, so we had one full tray of spinach left. So I kept it in the, um, you know, in the greenhouse on the table and the exact same thing happened. It, it, damp it might have dampened off. Yeah. It sounds it's like. Yeah. It's, 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 if it's that fast, it sounds like 50 or rhizoctonia. We, we have a terrible problem with that. And, um, we have not not come up with a good solution but it's usually they usually are resistant to those uh fungal pathogens after about three weeks so that's that's surprising that you had it with to me that you had it with uh transplants and, yeah, and, and, plus it's, direct, so. and it was two separate plantings too so it's not like yeah and i try not to over water spinach because i know that affects the germination and all that so i try not to soak it too much so i don't know you take any pictures uh yeah i'll send you some Ian, later but that was crazy <laughs> that was the biggest kind of spinach um crop failure for us um okay so unless it, has anybody has anybody tried sue s-i-o-u-x um from osborne we, that, that's worked good for us be right for, for what the for the fall or, or general uh usually do it spring and fall mm -hmm. um but yeah, it's 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 a it's a pretty solid performer. I love Osborne, so I'm I'm apt to try it. Yeah, they're. I mean, we didn't really yeah. know they were around until three or four years ago, but they're. It's a great company. Yeah, I get all my radicchio seed from them. They're they're really and their their packaging is great. Their customer service is great. Anybody have recommendation for the Swiss chard or the beets? Charbel is great. I love Charbel. It's got great cercospora resistance, um, prolific, super prolific. I think I harvested it from mid-May until 
uh, early October this year. One planting. I have, I have trouble um, with leaf spot on chard and in beets. Is that likely boron issue or? Probably Sarcospora later in the season. Um, I get it in the summer and yeah, all through the fall. Some varieties are really susceptible to it. Um, what do you grow? What varieties? Uh, the uh, rainbow Swiss chard and beets is red ace or boro. Red ace should be resistant to that, so it might be something else. Somewhat. Uh, I, I, it's I don't know. We get, we get a lot of sarcospora on red ace. It's um, bor boron can help uh the plants, but it it um. It, it won't it won't uh, completely eliminate it um there's some if you're willing to spray uh i have a um i was on a walk in a in a farm and they had really good luck with um they had sprayed uh copper and double nickel yeah. i think cornell kind of came up with that that combo and that, that seems to help but definitely if you have low boron they're going to get whaled you know like really early in their growth and you'll, you'll, you'll really suffer a big yield loss in you know, beets. And then with chard, it's the leaf, so you're out of luck. I yeah, found Kestrel is the beet I grow, and it's got really good circospora resistance. Uh, shockingly good. What's it called? Kestrel, like the bird. And okay. if you're growing a rainbow mix, one of the varieties in the mix might be more susceptible to it, and it might be like an entry point for it. You might want to look into what is in the mix of your chard. I've never gotten it on, on Charbel, the Circospora. Charbel is can I, can, I, can, I say, can I say one thing about the boron? Just, <laughs> you, you gotta be really careful with that. I don't wanna be like, spray your farm with boron. You can go from, like it's, it's you're, met, you're, you're spraying, uh, a foliar spray of boron is like a quarter pound to the acre of active boron, you know, of actual boron, which is like a, a pound and a quarter of solubor. So um, you need to be really careful. You can go very quickly from, you know, uh, to a toxic level. So I, I just throw that out there. I don't. I don't want anybody frying their beets next year <laughs> with boron. <laughs> Further on that, you mentioned earlier you're trying to find someone to make a mix, uh, fertilizer mix with that in there. I've I've got that from Fortrell. They have like a one ton minimum, but they have a very competitive prices mixing uh, lots yeah. of different most of whatever you want um, and I've got them to mix in some boron although I question how effective that is given such a little amount and such a large volume and how well, well that's spread around but um, they claim to stay good so I don't know I think that's a good question um, if they're putting solubor in it's probably okay but you can also get uh, boron in a it's a 10% uh, pellet or, or large particle and that that I would really worry about, you know, what where that's going. So that's kind of why I like spraying it because you, you know you're you're just uniformly applied to the field. You can dial it in. Yeah, I use a backpack sprayer. So. That's fine. Yeah, in the greenhouses we use a backpack sprayer. Yeah. All right. So I think we just. Oh, there was one little other page. Um. So. One somebody asked about managing shiso. That was actually Sari who I think left. Um, cold tolerant winter growing greens and chicory or DQ. Right. The weird chicory year. I had a hard time and I grew a ton of it. I just tried um, my Buna, it's called. It's kind of like Mizuna, but it's spelled with a B. It's supposed to be like a super hardy, um, cold tolerant green. I, I might be Osborne. I'm not exactly sure. I'd have to check my notes. Um, but we we liked it. We just harvested it last week for our winter share. It was outside, um, uncovered. Yeah, last, uh, so we grow red mustard and tatsoi mix at the end of the season. And we just kind of kept it in the ground and it's, totally survived um you know the teens over and over so yeah they're very hardy i had a lot of luck with um alliance um chicory 
really productive and very sweet. What kind of chicken are we talking about? Radicchio? I mean, it says radicchio. But people oh, are, mine's what? Es, mine was escarole. An escarole. <clears throat> what is it called? Eli oh, Elliot's? Elliot's or a line. I don't know how you say it. What's E? Yeah. E L I. Yeah, I think it was Johnny's. Benefine is a great um, frise variety. Uh, it's really bolt hardy. Uh, gets a, it's self blanching. Uh, you can band them if you really want to. We don't have to if you plant them. I plant them at ten inches um, in row. They blanch really nice. Um, and I was never. They very rarely bolt. Um, what frise variety was that? I'll put it in the chat. It's called Benefine. Okay, great. Or I could be completely mispronouncing that. Yeah, I, I second that. That's a very solid. It's a good one. Yeah. That's done really well for me. I also grow Eros as a escarole. This works really well. Is that bolt? Is that bolty? I've heard Eros is a little bolty in the heat. Uh, well, I don't grow it in the heat. I'm trying to grow a spring, a couple spring plantings, and then a lot of fall plantings. Yeah, I try to. I, it doesn't work that well. I haven't had issues with the bolting on me that I recall. We grew a Leonardo radicchio um, intercropped with peppers just on the single row on the outside of the bed. And that was amazing. It worked really well. Uh, a really uniform one up until this year was Galileo, which is a Caso Franco type uh, through Osborne. Uh, there was a lot of way, a lot of weird seed stuff going on. The varieties I bought either didn't fully head up or they grew oblong instead of round. I got a lot of weird seed stuff with my radicchio this year um isn't that typical though yeah but it, like the entire set was oblong not just and it was uniformly oblong when it should have been around i never called i was born about it it was the galileo and then the next i grew three plantings of it or two or three plantings and the second one was round but tiny and the last one stayed oh it was everyone every single there was every single one was different and none of them looked like galileo was supposed to look like it was the weirdest thing <clears throat> um Leonardo's great. Belfiore is great uh, for an open an open radicchio. Um I grow spring for a uh Treviso, which is pretty good. Um I've tried the non-forcing Tardivos before. They're I don't know if anyone's interested in doing Tardivo. I usually dig them out and force them. Um I don't have the space for that. It was okay. They were just real, they were small, but they were cute. Um, if you go to Osborne's website, they have the very detailed, uh, planting guide for radicchio and when, you know, how long they are, you just have to remember it's a Pacific Northwest company. So the dates are a little different than we would have here. Um, but they're, it's, it's Sue, they have a great selection. They probably have 15 or 20 radicchios you can choose from in different time slots. Yeah. I read a research or something that's saying that very finicky on Exactly when you slot them in on how they perform. Do you have, does anyone have experience on, you know, what, what part of your crop is marketable? Like I've grown it and I feel like less than 50% of the crop is marketable. And I want to grow more, but it's just like so difficult to get a good yield. I've been pretty consistent. Um, Galileo, I mentioned it because it up until this year had been super consistent. Um, Leonardo can be as well but i had all kinds of weird problems with my radicchio um are you are you marketing a is it wholesale or is it for farmers market um, mainly. it can be true my wholesale guys will take everything regardless of size um you're going to get some it, it's such a wide kind of maturation window that you're just going to get wiggle you have to remember that too you're going to get someone which there's a two usually a two-week window that radicchio will come to size so i don't know I sometimes you have to har you harvest like two thirds of it, then you're sitting around waiting for the other third to size up, um, which can be a pain in the butt if you want to flip it, you want to flip rows or you want to break a field up. Um, a castle, a castle Franco that we've come across that's really reliable is like uh, I don't even know how to say it, Geoforn Fione, something like that. It's actually through Johnny's. I used to buy a lot of my Castle Franco seed through Osborne, and I was having the same problems um, that you were describing. And we grew it this year. We grew it twice, actually, pretty late in the spring, and it 
all headed up just fine and we grew it again in the fall and it's probably the only Castel Franco I'll be doing um this year just because of that variance um, I'm gonna I'll, I'm gonna check that out Johnny it's a yeah it's Castel Franco it's a Johnny's yeah they're cut there see Johnny's is trying to <laughs> come up with more reliable seed than radicchio but also mimic Osborne in their amount of available so Castel Franco only recently has become more reliable within like literally the last few years um it's yes, spelled g-i-o-r-f-i-o-n-e and i think it's johnny's i'm most likely sure it's johnny's it is. Not. i remember it's, seeing it yeah yeah, yeah. It's a bummer because so uh, galileo was like a one pound head dense one pound head like all of them came up perfectly two years ago um, yeah was, and with, really, wow. yeah and you were mentioning um, Treviso Tardivo. We did not have any luck growing that, just headed in the field, um, just because it never really sized up and the flavor wasn't as good as the stuff we forced. But the stuff we forced is the Incantore, and we just use our greenhouse with extra layers of um, shade cloth in it, and we just heat it to minimally heated. Um, and yeah, we're harvesting it right now. We've got pretty large. Yield. That's the, I don't have I can't heat my tunnels so then I have limited space that that you have to keep it at what fifty degrees. Forty. We keep 40. it at forty. Obviously, with the on a sunny day, um, it'll it it gets up to seventy. You know, during this during the day, um, but yeah, it, it likes the cold temperatures because it is a radicchio. It'll actually make them taste better. Um, it's just that you want to also get growth <laughs> yeah. instead of it just hanging out. You know, that's that's. That's high level stuff that you're doing. Might be out of my purview, but maybe we'll try it. Maybe we'll try to. What do you What do you put them in when you're forcing them? Bulb crates. Yeah, so we're they're in bulb crates, standing straight up next to each other. We try to leave as many outside leaves on them as we can, so we can get that nice blanched heart. Um, and then we actually put them in like a water bath almost. Um, it's just you know uh, plastic lined two by sixes and put water in, let the water get absorbed, put more water in so it's not just constantly um, sitting in water. Uh, and then it needs like, I think it's, I wish I was better at the dates. <laughs> How many, when might have been three or four weeks in the greenhouse till we harvested it again after forcing it. When that might be off. What time of year, in November? Uh, yeah, they're one of our last things we dig. I'd hide as long as you can, you two can as high. long as you can keep the deer out. <laughs> Yeah, I have I do it's not a problem for me. Um yeah. not yet. And can uh, you get a, a good price for all that effort? Oh yeah. I, mean, I think it's a good price. Where where are you? I, the, the the jury is out on whether these kind of radicchios are profitable for sure. Um we do wholesale, so to restaurants, twelve dollars a pound. Um, and if you get a good head, it could be a, you know, half pound. Okay. All right, guys, let's move sense? on just because, uh, time is, Sorry. Well, time has run out. <laughs> but, um, I do want to go through these questions just because I know a lot of people, um, um, access the, the recorded video. Um, those, the, those of us who couldn't make it. So let's see. <clears throat> Um, I think these were Kirsten's at first, the first few. Um, do people, yeah, use, uh, you know, other seed companies other than High Mowing and Johnny's and the, the big ones? And what crops have they had su consistent success with? I've used true love for like really random herbs and they I found they had really good germination rates. <laughs> um I know I can't really think of and the big guys make it so easy. Territorial is not on there, but they're not really small. People use territorial, it's not that small. Yeah. And yeah. Baker's we, Creek isn't on there, but there's we I love uprising cool. seeds. Uprising seeds is also on the west coast. Um I also get Sorry, I'm not continuing the chicory talk, but I also get chickory to them too. What was the last thing you said, Aaron? 
Um, sorry, it's um, uprising seeds. I get a lot of the chicories I was talking about. Their oh, seeds okay, through yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. I guess seeds from uprising too sometimes. Seeds from Italy is also a pretty good uh, radicchio source. Uh, I'll put the radicchio down. Yeah, I used to get more seeds from Kitazawa, but their customer service is not very good and some of their seeds are not reliable, so. <clears throat> well, they were bought out by True Leaf now, right? Isn't that... Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. But it's still the same people that, you know, when you call them, I feel like, I think it was. Anyway, it's, it's like this one lady that <laughs> has like, I don't know, just not good. Not good customer service. Okay. okay, so crops across the board that can or have been able to tolerate wetter feet um, and have a decent disease package to handle molds and bacteria. And continuing on with that, um, crops that can tolerate excessive heat and drought. The water one is anything that's, I think, held high, anything that hugs the ground, you're gonna have problems with, regardless of the disease package. So anything, you need stuff that sits up higher um like that bow trans cabbage sits high some of the lettuces sit high remains i'm guessing would be better <clears throat> than a lot of like the bibs or the the low kind of low flying lettuces yeah, and i think it makes sense to if you can put in some drainage and having wet issues year over year these raised beds, so we uh, we have to. Otherwise, we'd be uh, we'd be non-functional. Okay, uh, which seed vendor do you work with the most, and why? Johnny's, uh, they're easiest, they're reliable, and customer service. Yeah, same. Johnny's just makes it so easy. And their website like interface is just like the best. And they have um, a lot of information. That yeah. If you want to find something specific, is this going to work for what I want to do? And they have it all there for you to make the decision. Honestly, Honestly. Yeah. Like Johnny says like seeds per pound. I don't know how you, you know, weigh out your leftover seeds at the end of the season when you don't have that information. So yeah, I love all the info. Have they stopped putting, they did for a while, and they might have started doing it again because people complained, but for a while, they stopped putting uh, germination dates on most yeah. of that stuff. No, it's bad. Super on. sketchy. During the pandemic, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that sucked. It was like a free-for-all for two years. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea what's going on. And, and the germ rate, germination rates, I noticed, were all over the place in that time. Yeah. Oh, well. We were all struggling. Okay, which crop have you found is most profitable per row foot? I actually did this, uh, you know, the, the calculation on my spreadsheet yesterday. I mean, the herbs are obviously, it's just so profitable. Um, for me, like some surprising, surprising ones are like okra and scallions and yeah. Scallions, definitely parsley. Um, if I get a very good stand of densely planted winter carrots, that could be up there. Um, dandelion greens. If you... Is that popular? <laughs> uh, not super popular, but I got a grocery store that buys uh, like a set amount every single week. Oh, okay. And do you get um, regrow like cuttings from like multiple cuttings? Yeah, I plant it in the spring and cut it all the way until it's killed by the frost. Wow. That's yeah, crazy. I get, get four or five. Same with the parsley, four or five cuts. So you cut the parsley all the way down to let it regrow when you harvest? Yep. Yep. I plant, I, I paper pot. Uh, the parsley and two inch paper chains and plant it super dense so it's just like a big hedge and then and then it can, I can you know get 80 bunches in you know 30 minutes 30 40 minutes and but you're talking about parsley is sown like every two inches 
Uh, yeah, even thicker. Like I put multiple seeds per two inch cell in the pocket, wow. paper pot and then put four rows on a 30 inch bed. And basically you got to harvest it before it um, suffocates. So I get uh, 70 bunches a week off of a bed and I, during the main season. And then, so I'll just harvest a quarter of the bed. And then by the time I get back four weeks back to the beginning of the bed, it's grown. Yeah. And <laughs> does any of your parsley bowl? <laughs> Mine? It, it like does. How? Yeah. It does. Uh, it tends to be variable when it decides to. Some years it doesn't. Some years it's yeah. worse. And then yeah. the new strategy has worked very well is just take a push, push lawnmower, mow it down, throw a little bit of compost, like a, not a lot, but like a a bit of compost on it and let it regrow and most of the bolt immune going away. Does that affect the flavor? Uh, I found it to be still sweet and good. Um, customers are still buying it. So a wild way to grow parsley. I mean. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I grow, yeah, I grow them like 12 inches apart, but I can get the, yeah, harvest them all season long till frost. But yeah, sometimes more bolt, you know, in some years than others. And once they bolt, I haven't. So you're saying if you cut it down to the ground, it might it just regrows its leaves. Yeah, give it a little bit of compost or you know a little love, and it it worked. Yeah. Huh. It, it's also super sensitive to temperatures below fifty degrees, just like celery is. Yeah. And so if you're your if your earliest ones you get out and you get this cold snap, they could bolt faster. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I, I always oh, run into that problem too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how do you determine your prices each season? For wholesale, <laughs> I, for wholesale, I actually, I'm friends with a lot of the guys that I work with. I harass them and I get the prices from their high end vendors, and then <laughs> use that as a starting point because it's kind of hard. It's like throwing darts with wholesale sometimes. Right. Yeah. Interesting. But I talk to them and then that way, you know, they're willing to pay a little bit more than they pay for like Baldor because they're getting it. They're getting to pick stuff and they're getting it even fresher than Baldor has it. So, or whomever, the, the target or whoever working with. So it's, it's kind of like cheap. Restaurants. What's that? Restaurants you're talking about when you say wholesale? Restaurants, yeah. It's, that's, and that's very narrow, I, the, even for wholesale, because that doesn't really help you with you know, grocery stores, it doesn't really help with markets. That's more, I think a lot of people price based on the, the, the veteran growers at a market they go to. They, you know, I find prices tend to regulate uh, farmers markets around a baseline that, you know, some people will hire lower, but that's usually, you have a bellwether kind of to, to guide you. At the beginning of this season, um, Allison Angelini from Full Heart Farm did a little survey on the new CT Farmer Alliance listserv about pricing and then sent out this document um, that has both direct consumer and wholesale pricing on it. I, I would be kind of interested to see, you know, how this changes year to year and if this is something that folks in Nixville want to see us do yearly to sort of see what other folks are charging um, could be something we could take on. Yeah, MC, I feel like somebody in the steering committee or, you know, somebody that you hire can do that survey every year because I think with Allison's collection, that was, I don't think she had that many, um, you know, um, many points. and yeah, and I mean, obviously you, you have to take it with a grain of salt because everyone's markets is different and exactly. um, such different context, but yeah, it would be interesting if like you guys kind of just had a survey that every year. Mafka does one and you can, I used to be able to find it online up in Maine and they had probably 70 farms and it's Maine. Uh -huh. So it might be, it's different, but they had a ton of farms and they had the high end, low end average. And it was everything. Like any yeah. kind of commodity you could find at a farmer's market. Um, or, or tons of people. I haven't seen it recently, but I know they used to do it and it was just, they just posted it online weekly. It was done weekly, which is crazy. Yoko, why do you think that um, she wasn't able to get a lot of participants? Is it just people don't want to 
you think if it comes from Nikfa that people will be yeah. more willing? Yeah, it was like not super formal how Allison did it. It, it was just out of, I think, her email. And yeah. It, yeah, it just didn't get that much attention, you know? Okay. It wasn't like Becca was resending it and, you know, it just didn't get much, yeah, attention exposure okay i mean i it was it was helpful for me even though it was limited i use various sources to figure out um how i'm going to price things for wholesale and retail um so mc maybe that's something we can um we can do for next season yeah and kind of maybe add a detail like you know how big are your bunches i don't know how you would you know frame that but like it's hard to say how you know if you ask another farmer how much is your kale bunch you you have to know how many stems they put in, how big the leaves are. Right. You Do know? Most people like count the stems, have like a baseline for stems or wheat in their bunches, or is it an eyeball thing? Because we weigh ours and then we get good at it. We can, have, pretty soon you can just do it by eye. Yeah, but it's eyeball for us. Really but like it's it's helpful for when you're teaching somebody who who's new at your farm how to bunch kale, then it's really helpful to be like, all right, start with stems, you know? So Nova New York also has a price index on their website. It is not very populated and they even offered people money to populate it and people didn't want to do it. So <laughs> it is a baseline and they do the range. They have a wholesale and a retail. They have different regions of the state. It's just not all the way filled in because farmers don't want to share what they are selling things for. Or right, MC, I think it needs to be like fully anonymous. Like, you know, just people submitting know that it's, no one can see who wrote it kind of thing might be better okay There's yeah and i think i'm sorry just one other thing and if they can sort of say the size of their form too right like some some sort of indication as to where they fall i think that'd be really helpful right yeah more information the better and you okay. just have to go into it knowing there's going to be farms that price dramatically differently at different markets so that's why high and low is real handy yeah yeah Okay, there's actually one more page. This is the last page. <laughs> um, intercropping success. I don't do that much of it anymore, but I definitely do peas and beets, which are always great. Um, and then lots of intercropping in the um, greenhouse next to the tomatoes. But I dropped the rest because it's just too complicated for employees to follow, really. Yeah, I do a lot of, I put radishes everywhere, um, especially in the springtime. Like I don't play a, a bed of radishes by themselves until late spring or early summer. I'm just throwing it around, you know, along peppers, between kale plants, along broccoli, and even between head lettuces sometimes in the early spring. Um, and um, yeah, I've used to do a bit more of intercropping things, but basically whenever any uh, any single row main season crops, I'll, I'll tend to put whatever I can along the edges. Um, you know, any, anything that's quick growing, anything that's 35, 40 day uh, maturity or less. Right. Um, I just wanted to mention MC, it's, it's almost seven. So I don't want you to like have, have to feel like you have to take notes beyond that. So um, just letting you know. Um, um, I thought the seed storage question was pretty pretty important. So maybe we could at least answer this one and the rest are a little bit, um, I don't know, you know, maybe not as, not as important. So <clears throat> um, how do people store seeds? And is there any nice like organization tips and storage conditions? Keep them in our office, it's like pretty stable temperature. And there's a million ways you can store them, you know, by variety, by season, by family. I was gonna buy a dedicated um, fridge actually. Do you think that's crazy? <laughs> yeah, that's necessary. I mean, we've had, we don't really, we blow through seed so fast and I don't like using old seed. Um, right. Very so, 
Yeah, last winter it got we were away in Japan for five weeks and it got down really, really cold. And we keep it in the, you know, like the downstairs of our living space. And I guess it got so cold that it really affected a lot of our seeds. Like a lot of our seeds that we had just purchased, even. Um, they the germination was absolutely terrible. So we learned the hard way that we, you know, can't store them where we normally store them. <clears throat> so yeah, I tend to free, uh, keep them in the cold room just because they're handy uh, um, for employees and people to use. Um, but I, I, don't know, I don't exactly like it because they get when you bring them out, then they get condensation on them and it just yeah. all reduces their life. But I don't have a I don't have a great place to store them um, elsewise, I guess. Thinking it was the same same as you was maybe a dedicated thing, but I keep them in like a big uh, plastic bin with a lid, organized by you know crops. Um, but I don't know if anyone else had any suggestion. Upright tool chest or set of drawers or something. I love what Kristen just sent around. That's pretty awesome. I, I keep them in um, just clear plastic boxes, but having them broke, and I'm constantly like going through them. So I think having them organized by type or variety, that that would be great. Yeah, I have them in clear plastic boxes by family. They're like, you can fit a lot in a pretty small box. So. <clears throat> All right, well, it is seven. So I know um, if it's okay, I'm gonna see. Um, I was gonna talk to Ian about a few more things, but um, yeah. Yeah, totally. I will stop the recording, um, but before everybody takes off, I do just want to do a plug for, um, if this was not enough farmer to farmer education for you. We are having our farmer to farmer conference on January 27th. There's gonna be a bunch of farmer led workshops and kind of like opportunities for discussion like this to say what's working for you, what's not working for you, what resources have you taken advantage of that were worth your time, what weren't. Um, so you might wanna check us out there and we'd love to see you. Thank you so much everybody for coming and thank you so much uh, to Yoko for leading this every year. I think it's such a great event. So much for taking notes, MC. <laughs> thank you for everyone to, for sharing um, their experience. It's really appreciated.